Now, the keyword here is, again, uh, perpetually. Now, in chapter 4, right, we covered this particular uh, concept about perpetuality. We said that the present value of a perpetual cash flow okay, is a function of the regular pre uh, payment okay, times 1 over the discount rate okay, multiplied by 1 minus 1 over 1 plus i to the power n. Okay. Now, so how do perpetuality works? Now, if we have a cash flow that is perpetual, that means it goes on forever, your n therefore will be approaching infinity. If you have 1 over a very big number, you have this term, all right, closing to 1. Okay, oh, sorry, 1 over a big number is closing to 0, all right? And so you can eliminate this entire term, okay, cross it out, and what you are left with is PMT over I. Okay. Three things must also must always be present. Right? The first thing is that you must have an offer. Okay. Then the other party must accept the offer. And this offer must be substantiated with a consideration. Okay, so these are the three important elements uh, that must exist. Alright. So Okay, so basically under this scheme, you need to know that he's talking about the VC scheme. Okay, and under the VC scheme, the self-employed basically can put money into his own CPF accounts and CPF will automatically put the money he contributed into his OA, SA and MA accounts respectively. Okay, and the maximum amount that he can put inside is capped okay, by his net trade income that he earned or the maximum CPF contribution cap. All right. Now, so the question asks, what's the maximum voluntary CPF contribution that would be deductible in his income tax for the year of assessment 2013? Okay. So you want to know how much is deductible. Eh? Okay. So it's basically asking you what is the limit all right, that he can put in. Okay. So we know that his income is basically $100,000. Okay. So definitely, you know, the maximum he can go is actually defined by the maximum CPF contribution cap. And for the year of assessment 2013, all right, for that year, you have a which ceiling, okay, for CPF uh, of 5,000, all right, you have a total of 17 months. Again, you should know that this is 12 months of ordinary wages, 5 months of additional wages, okay, and then you need to multiply by the contribution cap, which is 36%. Of this, right, 20% goes to the employee, 16% goes to the employer. Okay, and you multiply these three numbers together, you get 30,600. Okay. So we can see that in a single period holding, all right, uh, arithmetic mean and geometric mean will exactly be the same. All right, so there's nothing to talk about. If you see this, you can quickly eliminate options A and B. Now, what about multiple periods, which is what you want to test in option C and D. Okay, so if you have a multiple period, that means you have a return observation of more than one period. Okay, so back to our example, let's add a year three to it. And let's say in year three, all right, the stock, because of some macro situation, okay, went back down to a dollar. So what we see here is that the holding period from the second year is negative 50%. All right, and if that happens, the arithmetic mean therefore becomes 100% which is 1 plus okay negative 50% which is negative 0.5 divided by two observations so this essentially gives me a 25% gain all right and immediately you know that this is wrong because if i invest in year 1 if the price in year 1 is a dollar and in year 3 is a dollar then essentially i have no gains at all all right so in a arithmetic mean all right it gives me a erroneous reading all right, now what happens if I use geometric mean? Okay, in a geometric mean, okay, I have two observations. The first observation is 100%, multiplied by the second observation, which is 50%. And then I take the square root because there are two, okay, observations, minus one. Okay, what I will get is basically one plus one is two. Okay, two times one plus negative 0.5 is negative 0.5. Okay, two times half, all right, is 1, square root of 1 is 1, minus 1, I will still get 0. 
Okay. Therefore, we know that to measure the return of an investment, the most appropriate method is not to take the appropriate uh, arithmetic mean return for multiple periods, but to use the geometric mean for multiple periods because that takes into account the gains and the losses. All right, so the geometric mean is more accurate. And that's the reason why, in fact, when we look at investment, we look at this concept called compound annual growth, growth rate, CAGR, which basically takes into account the, context, the concept of geometric mean okay, in calculating compounded returns. Okay. Now, when you talk about risk management, right, and to specifically identify which technique to use, you can create what you call a frequency um, severity kind of uh, matrix, which is basically a two by two matrix, okay, like this, okay, the frequency or the probability and the consequence or the severity, all right, and we say that if a risk is not frequently occurring or the chance of occurrence is low and the consequence is also low financially, all right, then you tend to want to retain it okay so risk in this quadrant you want to retain because these are risks that don't of don't often happen and even if it happens you can easily afford it like for example the chance of a light bulb blowing in your house okay even if it blows which it doesn't frequently happen to replace it it doesn't cost you more than 20 bucks okay just to change a light bulb so this kind of risk you tend to want to retain it all right uh, concerning losses that have a high frequency and chance of occurrence but in terms of uh, financial consequence that is low all right so in this context okay you will be talking about risk on the top left quadrant all right and these are probably risks that you want to try to reduce all right in terms of its uh, frequency of occurrence so you want to find ways to reduce the frequency okay now, when it comes to risks that are on the top right quadrant, these are risks that frequently happen, and whenever it happens, the financial consequence of severity is very high. Okay, so this represents risks down here, and these are risks that you want to avoid. Okay, because even if you buy insurance, they won't insure it because the second rule of uh, insurance says consider the odds. If the odds of a risk occurring is high, then they will avoid it totally so you cannot even get insured all right the other ways to manage it is to either reduce all right the severity or reduce the frequency of occurrence okay now when you have a risk that occurs on the bottom right quadrant these are risks that don't often happen but when it happens it is very financially consequential or severe and this is where you want to transfer the risk all right to the insurer so basically you pay a premium in exchange if the occurrence happens to you all right the insurer will step into your shoes to indemnify your loss okay